Hi there, welcome to Hat of Many Things with Mike and Tom. Joining us today is uh, Satyrus Bracato. Uh, say hi, Sator. Hi, I'm uh, Sator, uh, a.k.a. Satyros Phil Bracato. I've been a professional author since the late 1980s, uh, game designer and editor since the early 1990s, uh, best known for my work with uh, White Wolf and uh, Onyx Path Publishing on the World of Darkness. Uh, was uh, well was and <laughs> was one of the uh, the original co-designers on Werewolf, uh, Wraith, and Changeling, and I've been involved with Mage since 1993 as the uh, the line editor and primary author. Uh, did that from 93 to 99. Started up again in uh, 2013 with Mage 20, and I'm currently working on. Uh, one of the, the Mage 20 source books, Gods, Monsters, and Familiar Strangers, right now. I also have my own publishing company, which is Quiet Thunder Product. Yeah, Quiet Thunder Productions, uh, which I share with my uh, my wife Sandra. Bu- <laughs> Sorry, Sandra Swan. She changed her name recently. Uh, and we recently released Power Chords, Music, Magic, and Urban Fantasy. Uh, where can people pick that up? Is that a drive through RPG? Is that where they can get that? It is on drive drive through RPG and Amazon.com. Yep. And if anybody that's got me on Facebook wants to see the sheer size of the M20 book, Phil spent, well, say, spent a long time <laughs> slaving over. So it's, it's, I'm used to uh, seeing you on Facebook where they, they have a very odd naming policy. Um, yeah. Well, the, the problem there was I was on there as, as Seder for a while and then I got into a political argument with one of my ex wife's now ex friends and she reported me to Facebook for a fake having, name. And oh. apparently. Having a bunch of name, having a bunch of books published under the name Sadaros does not mean that it's my legal name. So they gave me a hard time about that. that is uh, unfortunate. My, uh, my author page is still under Sadaros, Phil Bricado. Uh, but uh, but yeah, Phil works. Phil Phil is fine. It, it's just I will try to stick to Sata, but I, I it's, it's what I'm used to seeing. So. I mean, the, the first question is, today we're going to be talking about roleplay games, uh, and that is the pen and paper roleplay games, the original roleplay games that all your favorite video games were originally based on. Um, so, I mean, what are roleplay games? Uh, that's an open question. I know what they are, but, you know, there's no use me knowing. <laughs> what are they for people who do not know? I, I generally refer to them as a cross between improvisational theater and chess. And the amount of improvisational theater or chess just depends on the on the game and the people playing it. And what would how would you describe them, Tom? Uh, yeah, I mean, so bad at this as always. Um, I haven't googled the definition for us yet. Um, I would <laughs> say, yeah, <laughs> we, we normally just start with the definition. That's that's why I mentioned that. Um, I would say, it's, yeah, it's, it's it's a game where people take literally take on roles. It's um often pen and paper although now there are video game equivalents um and you 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 go into a, a fantasy world or a cyberpunk world or a, a sci-fi world any goddamn world and yeah literally anything i think i remember when i first started planning a D campaign and the idea was to play it next year at uni when it came back in september and i showed it to my friend who'd only been playing like 40k up to that point and he was just like this is amazing you can literally do anything i'm like well pretty much and then yeah. it was like cool we have to start tomorrow <laughs> like i suddenly <laughs> brought everything forward he was like this is the best game ever we're playing this and uh, that's how i started my first 3.5 dnd campaign so yeah yeah so i think i would describe <laughs> roleplay games as collaborative storytelling usually improvised um <clears throat> i i think my first introduction to it would have been a board game like hero quest where you where you have the same sort of class system as maybe dungeons and dragons help to introduce and you go around the dungeon and then i would say that roleplay games as a a, a younger person's experience would be that you progress from that to something a more story based and more role based rather than game based. Um, game being the sort of mechanical dice rolling aspect of it. Uh, for me, they've been an absolute great ball of fun. I started in 2009 when I went to university. Um, so Sata was designing games well before I ever started playing them. Um, and you know, I've, I've, I think I've played in at least one weekly game since two thousand and nine. It's, it's an absolute, absolute joy. Um, which brings us a lot more than I do. Well, I, I think that perhaps the demands of my time are maybe a lot more structured than yours as an as an author and designer. <laughs> um, I suspect you sort of walk around the clock to get a product out, and then you you sort of have to hope it sells enough to get you to the next, the next stage of a product. Um, like many artists. 
Uh, sort of. That's that's more the way we ran back in the 90s. Uh, thankfully, these there is the uh, crowdfunding, the ability to crowdfund a project or crowdfund a whole series of projects uh, has taken out the uh, has, has taken a lot of uh, taken out a lot of the market uncertainty that used to be involved. And well, that still is involved if you're not crowdfunding your projects. Uh, with uh, Mage Twenty, we funded the entire series off of the uh, the, the crowdfunding for the the main rulebook. So that, that the, the sheer money in crowdfunding is opens up avenues that were perhaps not uh, yeah. previously possible. And I mean, if you're a, if you're an established publisher, presumably it, it's quite easy to do that now because I mean, I I knew nothing about Mage and uh, World of Darkness at all, other than my friends played it when I backed Mage Twenty. Mm-hmm. Mike obviously knew more, but <laughs> like we both ma- backed it without really thinking. I think. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Uh, I, I backed that. it with <laughs> about eight other friends. Then we all went in to get collectors editions. There are at least mm-hmm. eight of us that have the the full collectors gold edged edition. Nice. Um, I asked multiple people for birthday money towards that at the time when I had much less income than I do now because I would actually have been gutted if I'd missed it. At the time, I've been running a mage game, which in the end ran for four and a half years. Oh, so we would have been just very upset if we missed. So that that book is sat proudly on a shelf, um, and nobody's allowed to touch. It. <laughs> we we have we have a <laughs> we have a normal hardback copy for actual reference use around a table, mm-hmm. and a lot of guests are sort of terrified to leaf through it, but want to because of how pretty it is. And um, shout out to it was it Echo that did most of the art for that book. It is beautiful. Uh, Echo did the did the um, the the nine tradition. Uh, illustrations for the two page spreads I of, have one of, those of the tradition. <laughs> ah, nice. Which one? Uh, it's the Thanatos one, but I do want the whole set of nine going up the stairs in my house. Thank you. Yeah, there. Yeah, there were there were a number of artists involved in it, and I think I, I think they all did a marvelous job. I'm very very happy with that book. And another shout out to Echo. Actually, at the minute, he's working on a very pretty project with Patrick Rothfuss designing a set of playing cards based on the King Killer Chronicles, which is my favorite book series. So if anybody wants to support um, artists in conjunction with Mage, do check that out. Uh, it's funny you should mention Echo. I was just hanging around with her and her husband, Laz, yesterday at uh, Emerald City Comic Con. Excellent. See, uh, we don't have Comic Cons of the same size in the UK as you do in the US. They exist, but they're essentially just a, a marketplace. Guest speakers are, are minimal or not noteworthy. There's no news being broken. Uh, it's mostly a cosplay. I see a few YouTubers. <laughs> Which is surprising because you all have 2000 AD and, and really the comics comics have been so heavily influenced by 2000 AD since the late 70s. I'm, I'm surprised there's not more. Uh, I'm surprised there's not more action out there than there uh, than, than it sounds like there is. I think it's that it's a lower population, I think, is maybe one of the deciding factors. Yeah. So if the same percentage of the population are interested in the hobby, it's still a small audience. And um, we have MCM, which is like a big company that runs various comic cons and they seem to just be a bit commercial like it, it didn't start in the same way as say um is it san francisco comic con uh there's well there's, there's san, san diego. francisco san diego. There's, yeah. san, well, san diego rather there's new york new york is probably the largest because well it's new york <laughs> yeah i yeah. think san diego is the one we always hear about in the uk though yeah that seems like the big popular one because it was uh, correct me if i'm wrong it was kind of grassroots when it started not Oh, yeah, all, I think most conventions were, yeah. And San Diego, I don't even know how many years that, that one's been going. I've never been to the San Diego one, unfortunately, uh, just because I haven't been to San Diego since, since I was born. But um, uh, New York, I know New York has gotten quite large. And uh, uh, Emerald City is Emerald City is a good size, as I was telling uh, my wife, Sandry, uh, Sandy, yesterday. said it's it's a large convention, but it's not ridiculously huge. It's uh, it's it's pleasant, pleasantly full, but not you know Tokyo subway level like like I've heard New York and uh, and, and San Fran- and San Diego can get. So we're going to move on to the industry and Kickstarter etc. A bit later to go into more detail, but I think the first next question now we've had a brief discussion on what RPGs are is why do people play them? I think well, I think people play them for a lot of reasons. Uh, for me personally, uh, it's because I really like taking on the role of different characters in a in a fantasy setting. Uh, I know other people, and I've done this as well, who just play it for the opportunity to blow off steam and kill orcs. Uh, other people uh, use it as a tool for uh, for 
kind of a, a amateur therapy tool almost. Some people, uh, my unfortunately late former girlfriend Coyote used it. Uh, she was autistic uh, and she used it for a tool to connect with people uh, because the, the social rules and expectations were a lot easier to follow in a role playing game than they are, you know, away from the gaming table. And, and that gave her, uh, like a, that gave her a set of tools to connect with people. Uh, other people uh, like Sandy, like the, uh, the ability to just collaborate and tell stories and, you know, don't worry so much, don't, don't worry much about the rules. I, I prefer personally not worrying about the rules. Unfortunately, it's my job too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the, the crunch versus, um, for lack of a better term, fluff is a, is a topic later in the discussion. Also with a side note that you don't like the term fluff. Oh, yeah, I, I don't. <laughs> so we'll, we'll really get into that later. Um, <laughs> do, Mike, do you want to say why you got into RPGs? So I, I did it for fun, actually. I... I I'd wanted to for years. I'd played things like Hero Quest and little board games, and a lot of I, I grew up playing a lot of JRPGs, which are far more linear story based than computer gaming than Western RPGs such as Baldur's Gate, which are directly influenced on based on Dungeons and Dragons. Um, I actually I had uh, a girlfriend who had a sort of D and D basic set that she wanted to play more, and I was like, "Great, I love these kind of games." And then we we both wanted to uh, explore the hobby further. We both went off to different universities, we ended up splitting up, and I, I ended up finding the um, Manchester Metropolitan University Role Play Society, Vague, which is where I met Tom. Um, and I just made so many friends through it that, you know, I, I was I was off in a big city on my own, and I met a lot of people through a hobby where you were already engaging in something social around a table. Um, and it was such a big role play society as well that when one game finished, you'd, you'd switch to another group of people at another table, and everyone would have drinks afterwards. And and I just really enjoyed it. I mean, my first roleplay game was a Doctor Who system using a pre-generated Call of Cthulhu storyline where we played Victorian <laughs> torture agents. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> it, was, it was fantastic. Oh, that's them. And there was that a bit that fun. blew my mind where everything went horribly wrong and giant creatures from the other side came through a portal and we were you know, doing everything we could to stop them and unloading clips and it all fell into great despair and the session ended and then the next session started the exact same way that that session started and we're like hang on what's going on and they pulled the it was all a dream which is a cliche but worked so well because we'd been following it through narratively in chronological order why would it have been a dream right and what we could do with stories just i, I loved it uh so i, I kept doing it <laughs> <laughs> and after a number of years i tried dming mm. I, I think i'd kind of echo that i started with uh i was at warwick before manchester and i joined the society there i had a bit of a, a, a hit and miss start with dnd because i wasn't able to attend every week and then a friend of mine was like oh i play dnd i'll run a game and it was i mean it was properly tough in the kind of you were fighting the toughest monsters available it was very much a it felt very much mastering it, it felt very old school. Master versus the players. It felt very old school, but there was an overarching story, and like I went into it completely blind, playing a rogue, and like I chatted up one of the bad guys and accidentally told him our plans and things like that, and it just went <laughs> badly wrong for us uh, to the point where we were being summoned into a hell dimension every night and were struggling to get enough sleep to be able to do all our character abilities. Um, but it was it was it was excellent, and it was that chance to have a very like it was every saturday social thing with our friends and then i ended up dming because when that game wound down people wanted something else so i stepped in to fill the void with very little experience and luckily my players were okay with that and i had some good story ideas and I, i've always i always liked telling stories i think that's a big thing for me and now i've tried a whole variety of systems not just D. um i see how much more room there is just for telling stories i mean i've played some systems like fate for example which are very story focused and and mike's mike's game of uh vampire we're playing is very story heavy and in fact I think I my, my game tends to be more character heavy than story heavy as well like rather than a, a, a plot i tend to sort of focus on the, the characters and developing them and things happening to them and them changing and growing that's what i really like to focus on in games but from that story springs right Yes, yeah, I mean. of course, there is a story. I mean, you all absolutely hate the villain, so I've done something right. <laughs> so, I mean, what? Have, unfortunately, there are stereotypes associated with roleplay gaming, although those are starting to be broken down. What, what are some of the stereotypes, do we think? Um, does the term neckbeard springs to mind? 
<laughs> well, the, one of the stereotypes, which it has, it has elements of truth, but it's also very untrue of many gamers I know is that the, that all gamers are a bunch of overweight dudes, you know, losers who can't, can't get a date and, you know, can't function in society. And so they sit around playing elves and dwarves and, and, uh, and hating on people. And there are definitely gamers who fit that description, but especially in the last 20, 25 years, I mean, I've, I've been gaming with women since uh, 83, I think. Um, and, uh, the majority of people that I know that I game with are, would not fit anybody's definition of a, of, of a loser. And most of them aren't men. Um, there a few, I guess more than a few, it's like 10 years ago now, but, uh, our friend SJ Tucker, who is an independent musician, who is absolutely awesome. And everybody should, should listen to her and buy all her stuff. Um, uh, SJ Suge is her, uh, her nickname. Suge did a uh, a song called Play in D&D, which you can find on uh, on YouTube. And in it, there I was in it, uh, uh, my now former housemate, uh, Kay Kevin Wiley was in it. A number of our friends were in it. Every one of us is a gamer. And when the video first premiered and, and about half the, the group were either women or there's a, a, a non-binary a uh, friend of ours who was in that group, and all, when when the when the video first appeared, a number of people were complaining. Oh my God, they're they don't look like real gamers. Real gamers don't look like that. And we're like, um, yeah, I've gamed with all these people. I, I know that a number of them are gamer really attractive. Girls, That's what? Cetera. Yeah, exactly. And it's like you know, a gamer. A gamer can be anyone. One of the first people I knew who played Dungeons and Dragons, and this was 1981. I think one of the first people I knew outside of myself and my friend Chris, who we introduced to the game, was a member of the football team. <laughs> you know, and that was 1981, uh, when when most people didn't even know what Dungeons and Dragons was, much less you know most people in in, uh, in the tw- on, on high school football teams. So, I mean, there are noteworthy people who do not fit the stereotypes who played Dungeons Dragons. Uh, Dame Judy Dench springs to mind. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Vin Diesel, uh, Vin, Vin Diesel, uh, uh, my Chris eternal Wall. man crush, Joe Manganiello, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, Sherman Alexi, um, uh, Ronda Rousey, Ronda Rousey, Dan Harmon. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. the West Coast, uh, there's a lot of famous people that played it. Stephen Colbert, Stephen Colbert is constantly dropping D and D jokes and gamer jokes into uh, into his monologues. The ultimate sort of Tolkien uh, authority in so in regular media, it would be Stephen Colbert, wouldn't it? <laughs> Constantly <laughs> referencing was it was it the episode where he's correcting somebody's interpretation of the Balrog or something? Mm-hmm. Well, and um, and and talk about talk about people uh, and and the the popular legacy of D and D. You know, um, why am I blanking on his name? Oh, Peter Jackson. You know, Sir Peter Jackson and uh, Fran, his his wife, whose last name I'm blanking on, but they. Not only were they obviously gamers, but their their experience with D and D influenced heavily influenced uh, their their adaptation of the Lord of the Rings. And the first time I saw Fellowship of the Ring, I'm like, oh, that's what all those fights look like. And that's what fans, <laughs> that is what fantasy films should look like. It's what they should always have looked like, and it's what they should look like going forwards. Unfortunately, people just don't want to spend the kind of money required to make it look good. Yeah. Well, and the idea until uh, until. Uh, Harry Potter and the Lord of the Rings series, the idea that you would get actual actors and an actual director and an actual script to make a fantasy film w- was ludicrous. That, that yeah. almost Before that, you kind of had the, the original Dungeons and Dragons movie and its sequels. You had Xena. Oh, <laughs> and a long list oh, of things that would be considered very B-list. There are many drinking yeah. games to that original d and movie. Yeah. Even the even the early even a lot of the the legendary fantasy films of the eighties are really really terrible movies. They don't yes. stand up well at all. <laughs> Conan Conan is um, really bad. <laughs> yeah, Conan has a great soundtrack. <laughs> it, it has a it has a great soundtrack. The acting is terrible. The script isn't very good. The directing, the fight sequences, not not good at all. And Conan's one of the best of the lot. But uh, but Peter Peter Jackson he redefined and, the fantasy uh, film and the fantasy TV. I think without Lord of the Rings, Game of Thrones would never have happened, and Game of Thrones has been absolutely exactly. incredible. Yeah, absolutely. Just uh, with, between fantasy and comic book movies, the bar has been raised so high, and TV shows too, for that matter. The bar has been raised so high that 
almost nothing prior to say 1998 comes even close. Star Wars is about it, I think. Yeah. And even Star Wars hasn't really aged that well. <laughs> uh, my, uh, uh, you know, Sandy and I went to go see uh, Rogue One a few years ago, and then we, we were like, we want to watch the original trilogy, and we rewatched it. And- <laughs> it's really not that good when you take the glasses off, is it? When you take the rose-colored glasses off, it's a star and sta- it's a, just a sword and sandals plot in space. Yeah, I, I often refer to it as, uh, as as Lord of the Rings with lightsabers. Oh no, no, that would be Aragorn. Have you read Aragorn? <laughs> that is literally Lord of the Rings with lightsabers. The the different colored <laughs> flaming swords. The the father who um, is actually the bad guy and the big twist. It, it's it's Lord of, it's it's just what happens when you take Lord of the Rings and Star Wars and mash them together. But I believe when they were first released, the author was about 14, so fair play. And you end up with Jeremy Irons reprising his role from Dungeon- the Dungeons & Dragons movie, oh, essentially. God. <laughs> yeah, He's I such a good actor. The mortification. I, I love that Jeremy Irons openly will just say, people are like, why did you make such a terrible movie? And he says, well, I just bought a castle and I needed to redo the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> That's his motivation, was I needed a kitchen. I don't care how bad the film was. Um, and that is where art and business collide. <laughs> So, I mean, in terms of stereotypes, there was, uh, a little before my time, Phil, but you'll remember, the satanic panic. Oh, for God's sake, that, yeah. Well, it, <laughs> and it doesn't help that it's coming back around. I, I actually lived in the, uh, the, the town that, uh, that, that Pat Poling lived in, uh, Richmond, Virginia, at that time. Uh, and it was, it was insane. Uh, the, the entire... I, if I get go- if I get going on the Reagan era, I will never stop ranting. So uh, I'll just suffice <laughs> to say... It was part and parcel of the Reagan era, and it is, unfortunately, people are starting to revisit it now because apparently the, the Reagan years were, were so exciting that, that our government seems, intent, seems to uh, intend on LARPing them now. <laughs> but, uh, but yes, there, there is a, a wonderful uh, movie called uh, Dark Dungeons, actually, where I don't know if you've heard of it, but... Uh, my friend Ben Dobbins of Dead Gentleman Productions, uh, he and some friends did a straight-faced adaptation of the uh, the infamous uh, Christian tract from uh, from Chick Publications that, that came out of the Satanic Panic, and they played the movie completely straight. And at the same time, they made a mockumentary called in, called Attacking the Darkness, which was supposedly a film crew filming the filming of Dark Dungeons. <laughs> and it's meta That's and they're it. hysterically funny <laughs> so other in terms of stereotypes media representation uh indie films if anyone wants to know what the the negative stereotypes that are sometimes true of ind- individuals look like in a film check out uh zero charisma i don't know if you've seen that. <laughs> the main character of zero charisma is every negative stereotype of, of, of a, a D player known to man and it's actually a fantastic film it's really really good um which which also coined the term that a friend and i used for a long time to describe ourselves ironically uh in the neo nerd hipster douchebag <laughs> we get some uh, some editor of an online magazine joins their game and he's he's not sort of quote unquote one of them but he joins to fill a slot and starts derailing the plot and going off doing what he wants and the gm's like he's not one of us he's a neo nerd hipster douchebag um, and the game just starts to implode. <laughs> um, <laughs> in terms of what the get what it's really like, I would recommend The Gamers and its sequel, uh, which is as low budget as you'll ever see, but uh, keeps flitting between people at a table and them dressed as their characters, and has the absolutely wonderful moment where one character is not ever at the table, but he's always there in the background of every scene when they're in character, just stood in a heroic pose. And he arrives halfway through the game because he's been late. Says, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, halfway through a battle. Rolls initiative. Uh, the character springs to life, kills everyone. And he's like, oh, sorry, I, no, my girlfriend's calling. I really need to go. It leaves. And the character just stands there in the background again for the rest of the game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mark! Yeah, they, uh, I was just at, uh, Sandy and I were just at Zombie Orpheus Con uh, two, yeah, because it was two week, two weekends ago. And... They had Zombie Orpheus. It's the company that did the gamers and actually is still doing the gamers. There is uh, there there's a gamers two hands of fate, uh, and now they are currently doing a gamers four. I didn't even know there's a third one. I need to find it. Yeah, it's uh, hands of fate. Yeah, gamers hands of fate. 
I mean, the pile of dead bards in Gamers 2 had yeah. stages. <laughs> and um, also the bit in the first yeah. one when they're walking along and uh, the characters died, so he makes a new character. It's like, now remember, you've never encountered this character before in your life. Greetings, adventurer. We're off to kill the bad guy. Me too. Welcome to the party. And the GM's just got his head in his hand. Like, <laughs> You're trustworthy. <laughs> Yeah, it's so so humorous if you follow the hobby, and if you're not, it's a good insight into what the hobby's actually like. Mm -hmm. And and the backstabbing with the uh, backstabbing with (laughs) the fucking siege weapon. Yes, yes. When he steals, he's like, "I want to pick the guy's pocket." Yeah, you roll very low. You can do that. Hmm. Can I take his sword? Yeah, he he didn't notice. I want to take his pants. You can't. You can't take his pants. (laughs) Rolls the natural twenty. Takes the pants. It's like it's like. Can I backstab this man? Sure. Do I need to use a dagger? I, I think so. No, wait, I can use anything. She so goes away, gets a sword, comes back, gets a battle axe, comes back, has got like a, a, a seat, like a ballista, just sets it up behind the guy quietly and fires it for extra damage. Because <laughs> <laughs> it makes fun of the rules and the way that the rules sometimes don't make sense. Um, fabulous, fabulous comedy. And in terms of the satanic panic, if you want to see that in a movie form, uh, to exaggerated comedy effect, Knights of Bad Aston with Peter Dinklage. Ah, uh, yeah. Yes, it, some, some friends of ours were in that, uh, actually. Like, that was shot up here in the Pacific Northwest. And that, that's what some people seemed to think w- would, would maybe happen if people kept playing games and learning, quote-unquote, spells. I think it's probably worth mentioning as well that <laughs> the mainstream opinion seems to be improving. We've had things like the episodes of Community where they play D&D. We've had um, Stranger Which Things. Which was a great episode. I absolutely loved it. Yeah, oh, there's yeah, two brilliant really episodes. Wonderful. There's Stranger Things, where the main characters just played D&D, and that's fine. And now, I, I think, you know, it's the rise of the nerds on on the internet, on in TV and film. And yeah, there's still some odd stereotypes out there, but more people are producing. Even Big Bang Theory's done it to favourable response, even oh. if you agree or disagree with the, the nerd face that goes on there. Yeah, oh, exactly. I, so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I enjoyed yeah. the first few seasons when a lot of the jokes, half the jokes were aimed at nerds and half the jokes were aimed for nerds. But that balance just dissolved as the show went on and it became a laugh at the nerds. I remember a strong stance of the physics uh, student community was not to like Big Bang Theory, so it took me until maybe last well, year or I think two years they, ago to watch I think most the of guy it. that plays him insists that Sheldon isn't autistic, but it's clearly just autism for comedic effect. Right, it's it's not it's not a it's it's it, it, I hate to say you know aspy face, but but it really is uh, it, it really is a bad caricature. And again, in in the very beginning, the character was un, the the character displayed some realistic traits of of uh, of autistic spectrum disorder, and then it just it became the what neuroses is Sheldon going to display now, and that became just a a, a bad parody of autism. And uh, that's when I stopped watching it. <laughs> we we watched it for the first few seasons too, and you know we were amused, and then annoyed, and then disgusted, and then stopped watching. But you know, mainstream depiction, as Tom was saying, of roleplay gamers, etc., has always been quite negative historically. In that it's always been living in your parents' basement. It's either children or people who never grew out of it. Has been the depiction up until the last five years, when people have started to question that and brought it out and. The majority of the reason for that is writers like Dan Harmon, who grew up playing the game, wanted to uh, start pre- presenting it in a positive light. Um, and it's, it's been getting a lot, lot better. Um, but to that regard, you've also got online representation now and online communities. And shows like Critical Role, Dice Camera Action, Task Force Grey have just, just really taken off. Um, and... The, these people now have a community where they can centralize, where the rise of the nerds is tied very much to the rise of the internet and to the fact that people in isolated communities aren't isolated anymore. Um, how much do you think online representation has really changed the game? Well, in addition to bringing a lot more people into it and, and giving giving angry nerds a whole new way to be nasty to people, um, it, uh, it, from a marketing from a marketplace standpoint, it, it completely gutted uh, book-based role-playing games. I can get get back to that shortly. Um, and from a um, uh, from a standpoint of the the way that the, the both the community and the medium have changed, online communities and online engagement have given us have changed the conversation surrounding uh well not just role-playing games fantasy and hobbies and, and and so forth in many ways but has really opened up um some 
occasionally contentious, but I think really necessary conversations about gender, about um, you know, about sexual orientation, sexual identity, uh, uh, about ethnicity, and so forth. These are these were questions and, and discussions that have always sort of been there. Um, I mean, we've had several out out queer people when I was in college in our gaming group, and it was just like, oh well, they're just there at the table. But apparently, what we didn't see, what what those, um, you know, what what those who didn't, you know, those who weren't identifying or those who weren't part of uh, the the, uh, the the gay, you know, queer sub subculture in college didn't see how much shit those people were getting, even from their so called friends. I should say we, because I've been a, I've identified as queer since college, also, but uh, I'm just not obviously. That's not an obvious trait. So. Yeah, who you like is not always visible. Right. Um, actually, the, the the best gaming group I've ever played in in college came about a, as a result of one of the characters, uh, one of the players, rather, having his character rape a female player's character and half the, half our group getting up and quitting and forming our own band, uh, form, forming our own group. Because yeah, that and that experience among others was one of, is one of the reasons why I emphasize that so strongly in my own work. The, the no, that's not cool. No, it's as you know the, the 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 game master for that game asked us why we quit, and we said, are you, are you even asking this question? And he said, but it's just a game. Like, but everyone plays no. it to have fun, and empowerment <laughs> no. I think is a huge part of it. A lot of people play play games where they get to be heroes because it's about empowerment. I've played with with. Um, female gamers who create characters who who outright go around in an almost vigilante fan, um, fashion punishing um sexually aggressive men and and you know there are there are elements in their life that are going to have motivated wanting to play out this fantasy in in a game you know there is a lot of people when you play a character in a game some people like to play a, a huge varied character some people like to play a small niche of type of character they enjoy playing very much some people like to empower themselves in ways they don't feel empowered in real life so some people are that's like by character with very high charisma who's very promiscuous and, and you know gets around a lot because they don't manage that in real life some people want to play someone big and strong some people want to play someone nimble um and sometimes it's things they want to do in real life sometimes it's things they wish they could do it's, it's about empowerment it's the same reason you know people imagine being batman or teleporting or being a jedi it's, it's about imagining yourself as something greater and being able to sort of for a few hours be that Oh yeah, if I were to just add something. I, one one of the things that uh, I and other people uh, have been working work work hard toward with uh, with with our in designing our games is to empower people not just at the table but away from it as well. That's been a major theme in uh, in, in my work in particular, but in White Wolf in general, uh, as well as in games like Bluebeard's Bride, more recent games like Bluebeard's Bride, Fate, uh, uh, Blue Rose. Uh, Seventh C, uh, Monster Hearts, very much Monster Hearts. Going back to the uh, what I was saying a few minutes ago about the conversation that uh, that online uh, that online communities have opened up, we're talking more about things than we used to talk about back in the old days, and it's been it's an important uh, an important thing for some designers uh, that we inspire people. To bring the, the to bring that sense of empowerment from uh, you know, that 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 we experience with our fictional characters, and then take that out into the real world. So you can you can be heroic away from the table. You don't need an eighteen you know you don't need an eighteen strength to be a hero. Um, that you don't need to be uh, Brungar the Barbarian to be a hero. You don't need to be a third generation Tremere. Uh, of course, they're not really hero heroic, are they? Uh, <laughs> I don't think there are any uh, any legitimate third generation. That's true. There wouldn't either. be a third generation Tremere. Boy, the guy who the, the guy who works at White Wolf or worked at White Wolf is is fucking up vampire uh, setting elements. Sorry about that. <laughs> but my, my my point of all of this being that uh, ideally, role playing games can not only give us a sense of of personal empowerment, but more of a sense of empathy of understanding what it's like to be someone who's not us and we really want those those of us who are, who are putting that into our games we really want people to become more more aware more conscious um, and feel that they can be heroes too uh, and not just in a fictional sense but in a real one that ties in nicely something we're going to be exploring further but it can be the case that a lot of the time if something happens for plot reasons that leaves a player feeling disappointed or disempowered. 
but ultimately tells a better story. That is something that that players that are newer to the hobby can often struggle to accept or deal with. They feel very upset or very angry something's happened. But I find that a lot more experienced players go, oh, well, that's a really good chance for me to do this with my character. Because that, that sort of connection between an individual and a character can become so strong that I've had players at a table cry at their own character's death. I myself have had to, when a character that I've played has died after, you know, a year of playing the same character, I've had to get up and, and leave the room and calm down for half an hour before coming back to a table. Because you know what? It all made sense within the ta- within the game, within the narrative, and within the rules. Um, but it's still, you become very attached to these characters in the same way that you would in any sort of film, or even more so than watching a film, TV series, or reading a book series. Because you are intimately involved in this character and the way they think. Um, and I think that's what Exactly. One of the difference between seasoned and, and often new players is how they can react to some of those situations. And I think that leads in nicely to our next point we'd like to discuss, which is about being a player, you know, who are, who makes a good player, who makes a bad player. And I mean, experience is obviously part of it, but th- there are certain behaviours, I suppose, that come up that sometimes you need to explain to people aren't great. One of my favourite things is dropping people in who've not played it before and seeing how they react as a DM. You often get some really good stuff out of that, but I did wonder if you had more thoughts on that. Well, it, it really it, it depends on the experience. I mean, Sandy, my wife, um, had she had played D and D, I think once back in the eighties, and the experience was so negative that she hadn't played again until that's about seven years ago or so when she joined our uh, uh, joined the gaming group that I was with. Uh, that I was in with uh, with our friend and uh, illustrator Brian Syme, and she picked up on gaming like immediately as soon as it was play you know a matter of you know be, portray this character rather than roll this dice on this chart and divide by this and subdivide by this and uh and she she's an excellent gamer. <laughs> she, she's a wonderful gamer my, my girlfriend loves story-based games where she gets to play a character but absolutely hates crunchy based systems and we'll get into systems and and which the differences between systems later but different i think different systems and settings appeal to different people but i think what one thing that really is a fact is that what whatever it is you enjoy whatever genre of fiction you engage with there is a game that suits you yep and i think that a, a good gm and group can make a a maybe not quite as great system or setting fantastic but similarly being with the wrong gm or group can ruin something that is otherwise like great absolutely and that being said yeah, there is no right or wrong way to do that. There is no right or wrong way to play these games. There is only the way that you and your group enjoy. But what always has to be bear in mind is that it is a group activity and you all have to be enjoying the same things. Exactly. And that's I, w- I, would, I would make the distinction that there is a bad way of gaming and it's the way that pisses off your friends and hurts yeah. people. That's, that's bad gaming. <laughs> that's fair. Um, um, but you might be able to find a group that enjoys those kind of scenarios and things that you're doing. Unless you're just a douchebag, in which case you're probably going to struggle to find a group or friends in general. So what what do you think are good and bad player traits, Seda? Well, I, I want to reframe that as maybe uh, constructive and uh, con- constructive and counterproductive, or productive and counterproductive, just because I, I want to take the, the moral judgment out of that. I don't, unless somebody is actually, unless somebody is actively trying to hurt people in a game, I don't like to, to put a more, uh, put a moral judgment on whether or not I agree with their play style. Um, I think the, I think the positive uh, constructive traits in terms of, uh, for, for gamers would be the imagination to, uh, to, to create, you know, these, these people and, and the ability to collaborate with other people to tell something that's bigger and better than what any one or two people in that group could come up with. Uh, I think it's the the ability to connect with your character without connecting so deeply that you get neurotic about it. It's definitely a constructive trait. Uh, your abil- The ability to think on your feet, um, which I think is a, a big positive thing that, that gaming can um, that gaming can, can bring people. And a, Particularly a GMing. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> yes. GM's the next section, but yeah, no, it's uh, thinking on your feet as a GM, absolutely essential. Yeah. Uh, and your ability to collaborate. Uh, that's whether, you know, whether, whether one is a GM or, or a player, uh, which I emphasize a lot in my work that the GM is a player, uh, just a player with a different role. But um, the ability to collaborate and cooperate with people to create something greater, uh, I think, is probably the most constructive, most positive trait that a gamer can uh, a gamer can possess. 
So do you think perhaps one of the greatest lessons a gamer can learn is that it's not all about you? Oh, God, yes. That's perfect. This is a group activity. Yeah. There is no main character here. <laughs> just whenever you're in a party, just remember to stop, collaborate, and listen, and <laughs> you'll get further. I think one of the best things about that I heard was, um, all peace be to the late big bad John Schultz, um, who was, you know, uh, one of the forefront figures in the UK roleplay community, founder of the Student National, or one of the founding fathers of the Student Nationals, which we'll get to you later, and Tom and I will be attending again this year. Um, but he used to give a seminar before the Student Nationals for Vague members, which is the largest roleplay society of any university in the UK. Um, and one of the main things he would he would give in the seminar for the Nationals was, A, bring your pen and paper, make notes, remember everyone's names. B, was that sometimes the best thing you can do as a player is turn the spotlight to the people next to you. Don't grab all the glorious moments. Don't grab all the best moments. Share them and bring it out in people. Because at any table, you're going to get louder people, such as myself, and quieter people, such as my partner. And sometimes those quieter people need in-character questions or dialogue directed at them in order to prompt them to speak up and take action at the table. But you can bring out some of the creativity and things that you never thought you'd hear from these people. Um, it's not about you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, bad, oh, con- deconstructive traits. <laughs> the the uh, counterproductive traits, egotism, cruelty, selfishness, uh, the the attitude of I want to break the game, the breaking the game mm. and, and ruining it for other people is fun. Unfortunately, I've run, I've run, yeah, exactly. You know, if if you have a bunch of people who enjoy completely destroying everything in their path, that's one thing. But if you've got one person or two people who want to destroy everything in their path, and the other people want to play an an interesting interaction between characters that occasionally involves killing shit, you're going to have a problem. <laughs> yeah, to emphasize that, you you don't need to. So Munchkin's a term used to describe um, people who would like to make their characters as powerful as possible and destru- defeat every encounter and want to play in more of a, a game mechanical board game sense rather than roleplay sense. Um, but that's also not a wrong way to play. It's just not always right in every group. There are entire groups and adventures and storytellers or, or DMs designed for this and groups where this is what everybody wants to do. And that's the right place for it. It's not inherently bad it's just it can piss people off if it's not what they're after yeah the, the, the roots the roots of role-playing game for for folks who aren't familiar with it the roots of role-playing game are war games and the characters the idea of playing an individual character originally started with moving an individual unit around and instead of your uh, your miniature representing 10 men or 100 men it represented one man and then they then you know some of the gamers started giving that that character a name and then they started talking for that character and then the the origin of dungeons and dragons with uh, Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson Dave Arneson was favoring more of a uh, you know more of a storytelling approach and Gary Gygax was favoring more of a strategic approach this is a few weeks ago i was uh, I, I was on a panel on role playing game design and i said just imagine a venn diagram where your polarities are at at one polarity you have strategic and on the other polarity you have dramatic and on in, in the, uh, the counter axis at one polarity um, you have intuitive and at the other polarity you have calculative and at the strategic polar at the strategic polarity you have you know a game which is intended to simulate combat like the the very earliest uh, games of chainmail where it's you know your your swordsman is going up against those orcs and the the point of the game is to defeat those orcs uh, dramatic at the other polarity is but i want to tell an interesting story about my 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 warrior here and this is not necessarily a swords man this could be a swords woman my, my warrior could be gender neutral whatever i want to tell a story at the dramatic end of the polarity i don't care whether or not whether or not they're fighting orcs or not maybe we're talking to orcs maybe we're fucking the orcs maybe we we walked around the orcs entirely that's dramatic polarity. It's more about what's going on with the, with that character. Um, at the intuitive polarity, you've got very very simple rules that are based on in, you know based on the idea of what do I need to do? Oh, okay, um, I'm going to do this thing. Does that work? Oh, sure, yeah, okay, that works. Uh, with calculative at the other extreme of we have three sub tables for what happens when this kind of sword meets that kind of armor. Yeah, there was a Lord of the Rings system very much like that, wasn't there? Where um, 
it all made perfect yeah. sense when you thought about it, but it took so long. So, like, heavy armor would actually make you easier to hit, but you would take less damage from hits because it's harder to penetrate the armor. Um, exactly. Which makes perfect logical sense, but becomes a, a huge cross-referencing of tables. Um, and yeah. then, I mean, at the other end of the scale, you have fate. Did this work? Yes, no? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, that's exactly it. Fate, uh, Fate, Bluebeard's Bride, Monster Hearts, Apocalypse World are very intuitive, dramatic. Easy to pick up. Yeah. I think you can see that trend in Dungeons and Dragons where 5th edition has... Fifth, I love 5th edition. We see, uh, there are things edition. I like and dislike. Um, I... Well, it's always going to be Dungeons and Dragons. Of course. <laughs> of course. I yeah. absolutely love inspiration dice as an encouragement for people to roleplay. Um, I mean, that's straight out of fate like as a concept whereas i mean that's where i first encountered it anyway i dislike that all skills are boiled down to just your proficiency bonus because i feel like there's a an element of customization of what your character's capable of taken away there so i I, you know i like the crunch and i like the role play and i feel like maybe fifth ed doesn't have enough customization or crunch for me as an individual um i think my favorite edition of dragons would not be made by wizards it would be made by paizo um, <laughs> yep, Pathfinder, and and for and and there's there's that uh, there's that polarity, more dramatic, calculative. Yeah, and but then I also play Ars Magica, which is incredibly calculative, and I play oh God, yes. uh, White Wolf, which is incredibly dramatic. dramatic. I I will mm-hmm. play any game in any system. Um, I can't think of a, a one I've turned my nose up at yet. Have you ever seen Twilight Two Thousand? <laughs> I, I haven't. I haven't. I, no, I I can think of one I've turned my nose up at for being far too almost too calculative. Hero system. See, and I love hero system. <laughs> I, it, it, I just it's I looked at the charts and I was like, "This is just too complicated. I can't be bothered learning this." The funny thing is, hero system is intuitive, calculative, which is a bizarre, um, which which actually no, it's dramatic, dramatic, calculative. It, the funny thing is, is the the core mechanic behind hero system is intuitive. Every other element of it is calculative. <laughs> Uh, and, and admittedly, I haven't played Hero System in a long time, and a lot of my my love for the system is it's the system that won me away from D anD. Uh, I started playing Dungeons and Dragons in nineteen seventy well, eight D anD D in nineteen seventy nine, and got involved in medieval recreation in the, the spring of nineteen eighty three. And I was already frustrated with the system because it was so arcane and so. Um, frequently arbitrary um, yeah I, I think if i had to deal with thaco i'd maybe never have played <laughs> that's even before thaco thaco's second edition this is first but um but it was it w- was just it was a very frustrating uh, system that that was as a gamer and especially as a, as a dungeon master was driving me crazy because you had very rigidly defined rules and roles and charts for everything and then um bill bridges who is uh, now, you know, famous as the werewolf, the apocalypse developer, uh, and one of the co-founders of White Wolf, Bill Bridges and his brother John introduced me to Champions in 1983 when we met in college. And I was like, oh my God, I can build the character I want. And my first interaction with Champions was Champions Online, the MMORPG. Oh God, which was horrible. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, well, that was my first interaction with it. And I made a character so oh. broken that when every ability it had got nerfed, I had to make a completely new one. <laughs> oh, geez. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Champions Online was not good. <laughs> Talking of games that I've turned my nose off at, um, <laughs> literally listed as the game that must not be ma- named, according to uh, RPG.net's oh, Fatal? wiki. Fatal. Yeah, Fatal. that's a horrific, misogynistic, yeah. racist, awful game. Um, how can I, I, wait, I've not encountered this. How how do you work those things into a system? Is there some sort of stat differences for ethnicities? <laughs> it's the kind of system where you roll to work out, where, where you calculate your penis size and things like that. It's, what? It appeared at some point on the vague Facebook group. That's how is I this, Is this like all playable races, uh, Jewish um, traits, good with money? Is it? Is it like no, that? that? that would, it's that, that, that level white. of bad, yeah. Wow. <laughs> That would be that would be white racial holy war. There's another um, a racial white holy war. There's there's a, a game that is evil even worse than fatal racial white holy war. And oh, that also sounds awful from the title. <laughs> yeah. I, I would ask you if you can link it to us for the show notes, but I don't want to give it any publicity. <laughs> uh, th- so there's a link. There's a link to a wiki uh, which lists. A, uh, in fact, racial holy war is the second game in the unholy trinity on RPG.net. So it's total <laughs> racial war, holy war, and hybrid. How, how can you even have that? How is that a no? No. Yeah. No, no, yeah. No, no. 
like yeah, the first lines from this this wiki fatal when it first hit the fora it was greeted with dis- derision and disbelief is there a tv tropes page for it because that'd be hilarious it must be and equally racial holy war the pcs play white warriors fighting against the classic enemies of racist group like that's how does that exist yeah <laughs> It, it exists because people are dicks. <laughs> well, yes, and sadly, that is true. <laughs> there, there, are, there are people who will create shit like that just so that they can say that they created shit yeah. like that. Speaking of power fantasies, yeah, that's that's an unhealthy one. Not as bad as Fatal and things like that, but um, we've got as our next discussion point the concept of that guy. Um, and we have a link in the show notes uh, of yeah. uh, 2,500 things Mr. Welch can no longer do during an RPG, which I believe did the rounds on Live Journal in 2005. I assume, yeah, I assume you've seen this this article before, uh, Phil. It's a very famous article. Have you? Have I, you... I've heard of it. I haven't actually seen it. Oh, I, okay. Well, let's no. give some choice pick, quotes. Pick a number between one and 2,500. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 73. 73 is not allowed to name my cudgel the ceremonial whoop ass stick. Pick another number. We we can do this. We can do this maybe maybe ten to twenty times before before we we we're just wasting time. But this list is is uh, beautiful. Two hundred ninety eight. Two hundred ninety eight is is Sprechensee Bang Bang is not real German. <laughs> <laughs> and another number for us. Uh, five hundred and thirty six. Oh, I need to go to page two. <laughs> Live journal truncated the list. It's that long. <laughs> so if that was five hundred and uh, I don't know, sixty-two, I think I said five hundred and sixty-two. Pass without trace doesn't work on bad checks. <laughs> uh, let's pick <sighs> number four. All right, um, three. <laughs> Just number three. Um, <laughs> you couldn't pick is... that as number three, could you? <laughs> there is no gnomish god of heavy artillery. <laughs> <laughs> that depends on what game you're playing. I think Warhammer fans would disagree. <laughs> so, uh, fifth fifth choice. Okay, fifth choice. Uh, um, I'm going to go with my age. 53. 53, was that? 53. Not allowed to start a drow character weighing more than a quarter ton. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know where that was going when I started reading that one. <laughs> <laughs> so, number six. Uh... 430. 430. 430. Spray paint is not a substitute for proper camouflage. <laughs> Depends what game you're playing again. Because <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I would argue that in um, Paranoia, that might work just fine. Yeah. I'm, I'm I'm not really, you I'm can't red. Are you red clearance? Hmm. You, you can't <laughs> touch me. You can't arrest me. I'm red. You can't touch me. Okay. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick one for number seven. I'm going to go for 893. Let's see what that says. 893 is... Invisibility is all or nothing. It can't just target their clothes. <laughs> um, I mean, that sounds like a specific reference to some, dun- uh, some James past, Bond. Movie. I've seen no uploading porn to my uh, CO's hood, followed by no <laughs> downloading porn from my CO's hood. <laughs> so uh, number number eight, Phil. We've got three, mo- three more to pick. All right. Um, it's how many? 2,000 something? It's 2,500 total. Oh, okay. So uh, 1,099. 1,099. After a successful Black Ops, before I'm paid, I will not immediately adopt a dozen children for the tax breaks. <laughs> so, is, is this supposed to be about uh, Skyrim? <laughs> I, I think it's about any, any general game. Yeah. Some of them are clearly referencing specific things, like... Yeah, it's like <laughs> some of them are clear D&D references, etc. Yeah, and a lot of Lord of the Rings references. When a virgin sacrifice is demanded, I will not knowingly look at the paladin, Netrunner, or Hermetic. <laughs> No subcontracting dungeon crawls. <laughs> what? Contracting well, dungeon crawls. I, I quite like number 24, which is, even if the rules allow it, I am not allowed to summon 50,000 blue whales. <laughs> which I think is probably referencing 3rd edition, where you could summon a creature outside of its environment and drop a blue whale on your enemy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I missed that. This is why designing game rules is, is such a exercise in frustration and why so many why so many game designers have no hair 
if I mean, with any set of system, right? Someone, someone will come along and find a way to break it, and you just have to use some common sense. It's uh, one one of the reasons that Mage Twenty is half a million words long is because there were a lot of this is how this works, this is how this works, this is not what you do. This is not what here. Here's this question people have had for twenty years. The answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when we talk about systems later, we can get into just how open some systems are and how much of a nightmare they can be to try and mm-hmm. yeah. interpret, run, or design, God forbid. Yeah. And Mage would be one of those. I think Mage is possibly the most open system I can think of in terms of what can you accomplish. I guess in, in terms of what the magic system allows you to do to a point, I mean, yes. fate and... and um, uh, well, fate, really. I think fate, fate, fate and Apocalypse World may be the open the most open systems I'm aware of, but uh, but they're open within very narrow parameters. So Yes, as opposed to Mage, where there's very clear parameters in the world, but you what you can do, the way I describe it, is you can do anything if you have the right combination of spheres. If you theoretically have five, or every sphere at five, there is nothing you can't achieve. Yeah, and a very high irritate. A very high, and a very high irritate, and this is very much a 20th anniversary thing, and a focus that allows you to do it. Yeah, we, we always wondered that if you have enough entropy, can you affect your dice rolls out of game? <laughs> I'd like to cast a spell that will alter my dice rolls positively. <laughs> I think I, I think I exude an entropic field around technology when I'm frustrated. <laughs> um, so can can you play a game wrong? I think the conclusion is you can play a game wrong for the people you're playing it with. Yes. But if the people you're playing it with want to play it a certain way and there is a consensus, the answer really is no. Yeah, I mean, as long as uh, there's something I have on my uh, on my blog, uh, Sadaros Filbrucato at uh, WordPress dot com called the uh, uh, I think it's Satyr's Satyr, uh, Satyr's Am- Amazing Fantasy Spectrum or something along those lines, where it, it, I basically took the the extremes of uh, the extremes of erotic content, let's just say, in a, in a game that run from everybody's just running around naked fucking everybody and everybody every player is cool with it too oh my god what did you just do get the hell out of here and there are groups Uh, where that's okay and there are groups the majority of them where it's probably not yeah exactly and and that that spectrum works for everything because it's a matter of if the rest of the group is if the if the rest of the group is having a good time it's the most important thing with any of these games are people having a good time if people are not having a good time then you're doing it wrong and that leads us also onto being a dm are people having a good time your job as the gm is two things one tell a compelling story two ensure that your players are having a good time and there can be a lot of pressure involved in that i think Mm -hmm. well and and i would add to that a corollary a corollary third make sure you're having a good time too yes because like i said earlier the the gm is a player uh i've talked to a number of people there there was a guy i used to call I, i used to refer to him uh, as my my uh, my loopholes fairy, uh, because back when I first uh, when I first started doing Mage and Mage's first edition rules were a nightmare. <laughs> and, well, you uh, were trying to do something very new, I think, with first edition Mage. Yeah, yeah. And he would call up, and yeah, you know, he would call the office and 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 say, "My God, my players are doing this, and my players are doing this, and how can I stop them?" How? And after like three phone calls from from this guy, where I talked to him, I was like, "You don't sound like you're having a very good time." And he says, he, he just a long pause. He says, no, I'm not. I said, then why are you running for it? Then why are you doing this? He says, I have to. I said, no, you don't. This is a game. If, you're, if your players are making you miserable, you are not having a good time. If, if your players are deliberately making you miserable, your players are dicks. Don't game with kids. Don't game, don't game with dicks. <laughs> That's like, your, yeah, I've that. seen you write that as one of your rules. Don't game with dicks. Yes. <laughs> don't be a dick. That's what I said in, in, in Mage 20. I said the uh, number, Satyr's number one rule of gaming is don't be a dick. And the number two rule of gaming is don't game with dicks. I think the silence that there is. Awesome. is I, I think you can apply that to things beyond gaming. <laughs> yeah. Don't be a dick. Just don't drink. General life. <laughs> don't, don't be a dick. Don't go skiing with dicks. Like, it applies to most things, really. It's quite, quite universal sage advice, I, I would say. When you're a DM, I mean, I think it's something I've been, I probably wasn't as aware of in the past. And now I'm trying to make a point of being more aware of it, like checking with the players. I've always asked players if they enjoyed themselves, but that's a very general question. And something Mm -hmm. I know Mike has been doing after our sessions is specifically messaging us uh, individually and being like, did you like this session? Is there anything I could improve? And I feel that's the thing I'm definitely, I'm about to start a D&D game with the same group 
and when Mike's game finishes. I've started a much busier job, so I'm going to hand over the reins of DMing. I'm going to wrap up my campaign, and Tom's going to start a campaign of a different different drama and system. Yeah, and it'll be a bit of a change, but I want to I want to make sure everyone you know has a fun time. So I'm going to definitely follow on from what Mike was doing of messaging people. Was that good for you? Is there anything overall you disliked about the game? I've been trying to try to be quite permissive because I feel like within fifth as a system, you can uh, you can be quite permissive with what the players are doing because they can take more of a beating than they could in previous D and D game. But I mean, obviously, I'll see how that plays out <laughs> with the group. But I think yeah, having that conversation is important, and it's not just turn up for the game, fight a load of monsters, leave. It's that there is more around the game that you need to worry about. So in the same vein as constructive and um, deconstructive playing, what do you think are some of the, the most constructive and deconstructive uh, things that DMs can often do? Well, the most constructive thing I think a DM could do is, again, make sure that the players are having a good time to watch the players. This is something, and uh, I kind of I skirted past this at the beginning of the, uh, the conversation, but I got into uh, role-playing games and theater the same year uh, when I was 14 in 1979. And... So one of the things that I learned from uh, from from being a gamer who was also an actor is to watch the audience. And when you're gaming with a, when you're when you're uh, when you're the game master, your players are your collaborators, but they're also your audience. The mo- the most important thing I think for a game master is uh, being being attentive to the other players and making sure that everybody is is having a good time, including yourself. Um, and I think, and I've I've also written about this in uh, in Mage and Deliria and Power Chords, the ability to mix stuff up, uh, to to come into a gaming session with an idea of who's doing what to whom, and then just leaving it open from the point where the players get involved. Uh, mm-hmm. When I'm running games, for instance, I uh, my my preparation is pretty simple. I brainstorm up who's doing what to whom, write their names down on on some index cards, write out very basic stats for the characters who may or may not be involved and then just lay them out in front of me and and wing it um i used to be when i first started playing D, I used to do the whole plan out the dungeon spend hours and hours drawing out these really meticulous maps and lists and things like that and, and uh, you know ultimately i i realized nine tenths of that preparation was wasted um and the more the more i had game the more i just realized yeah, the story starts when the character when when the, when when the uh, when when you ask your players what do you do, and from that point on, um, within you know certain within certain parameters, obviously of established by who's doing what to whom, uh, to just to wing it. Uh, that as I think, it, 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 it's not a skill every every game master can have, but it's a really helpful one to uh, to have and to refine. Yeah, so Tom, how much lot. how much prep do you think I do for vampire? I don't know. It fe- like it feels like there's a fair amount of prep to your games because there's a fairly there seems a fairly consistent story most of the time. And I mean, you ask us a lot of questions, so I feel like you're doing a fair amount of prep. basically none. Yeah, <laughs> this is the thing. It feel, feels to me like you're doing a lot of prep, and I would say my answer would be the same to you for games I run. That I like to create a world, and then the world happens to the players. What I did was before I started running the game. I created roughly five important members of each vampire clan in the city. And then you interacted with some of them and you liked some of them and you didn't like some of them. And the ones that you did like spent more time with you and got more fleshed out just mostly through me playing them. I had ideas of those characters, but I didn't, I hadn't really written much down, hadn't prepped anything. I don't know what stats those characters have. I just go, oh, they would have roughly this many dice for this action. Um, And I improvise almost all of it. I have a rough idea where I want the story to go, but half the time that's not where you're going. And I, you know, there's railroading plots and there's creating complete sandboxes and the key is somewhere in the middle. You need a key idea of some key scenes that you want to happen, but you kind of have to let your players choose where they're going. But similarly, if there's no real hook, if there's no draw to go down a certain path, players will often mill around doing nothing. And I learned that in my four-year mage game when I created six plot hooks. And I said to my players, what do you do? And they said, absolutely none of that. It all sounds dangerous. We're going to stay at home and have a barbecue. (laughs) I like having... um like a, a timeline of thing, key events I want to happen that lead to maybe a big story. Eventually, the big bad guy is going to do something big and bad in a D&D world, and people will start to notice. But the first things might not be something the players would notice unless they're specifically looking for it. So you try and sow those seeds, but if they spend months messing around and then suddenly there's a big army at the doorsteps of the city, 
there's a reason the, the, that's that's how it, yeah that's how it's worked out and the, they'll be like oh how's that happened i'm like well this has happened every week that you've not been doing anything mm-hmm. <laughs> like <in the> past. <laughs> yeah i think part of the key is to make the world continue without the players so yeah the yes. players should have some of the most defining choices to make but the world exists around them not because of them mm. Uh, so in my vampire game, yes. there are machinations, there are elders, people are politically maneuvering against each other. And eventually, you players have picked sides. Pick who you like, who you don't like, who you want to support, who you don't want to support. But these people are plotting against each other, whether you're taking part or not. As I say, the moments where you've been like, oh, I mean, which player do you think should be the new prince? And we're like, well, not that guy. Everyone thinks he's a dick. And you're like... <laughs> Yeah, my players want to install the Malkavian Primogen as the next Prince Sator. Oh, jeez. That tells you the state the city's in, right? Uh, yeah. Oh, so Washington, D.C. then? It, it's it's, <laughs> it's uh, Portland, Maine. <laughs> so they installed the installed a Stephen King character in Stephen King's hometown. <laughs> there were nine months of gameplay where the original plot was that there was a werewolf killing vampires and they'd been sired to be used as bait and they just completely ignored it and went off doing other things. Eventually, they ran into it and and had to resolve it, but it was it just carried on killing people till they stopped it. Uh, actually, what you're what you're saying there, uh, what you were just saying about Portland, Maine, brings up uh, a, another answer to a question you asked a while ago about how the internet has changed gaming. Um, one of the things that I really appreciate as a uh, as a designer and an author is that the internet and social media allow us to do a greater amount of research and a greater amount of fact checking. You used, you used a lot of Google Street sometimes, didn't you? Yeah, Google Street. Uh, I, yeah, uh, I, I always, uh, I, for, for any project that I'm working on, I put together a secret Facebook group and I invite trusted friends and trusted players into it. And I go, okay, you know, so if I need to do this thing, how should I do the thing? And I, I make sure that if, if, the, um, you know, if, if there's a, 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 a passage of, of Spanish in there, you know, I would, I would ask you the people. Correct. So exactly. Because back in, back in the eighties and nineties, we didn't have the ability to do that. And this is where you get first edition Akashics versus M20 Akashics. Oh God, that book. Oh, or that kin- book. Or Kindred of the East. Oh, yeah. Where you, you, you know, you do the best yeah. with the materials you had at the time when all you had was library reference material and movies. And now you can right. ask entire worldwide communities of people, is this a correct portrayal? Exactly. And and I'm very, very glad we have that ability now because we, we had a lot of – we researched as well as we could research given the time and the, the, the time and the material. At least you never had, helped but, write Gypsy. See, ah, poor Tailwin. That, that's a perfect – that is a perfect example. Tailwin worked with the absolute best material she could have obtained in 1993 when she wrote the damn book. Uh, it's oh, it's total culture fail. Yes, but it's culture fail. Ba- it's very well researched culture fail. She didn't have the ability to go online and talk to you know a, a and chat. It's the same culture fail you had in films of the era. Exactly. You know, you you didn't have you know we. It, it's painfully obvious in things like the the Akashic Brotherhood you know, tradition book. Okay, nobody Asian was involved in this. Nobody Asian was in our writer pools. <laughs> or your favorite, uh, World of Darkness Mafia. Ah. Uh, <laughs> that the one came out after i was involved the thing the thing is if it, uh, justin and i actually talked about that one before it was actual before it was written and i was supposed to have been involved in it but i i got angry at people and canceled on my contract um being sicilian myself i could have helped them make that book a little less offensive um <laughs> uh, and and justin had asked me to be involved in in uh, in that group but just you know again it I had turned my back on White Wolf for a few years, and that was during that. Uh, that was during that period. Uh, being being a Sicilian, uh, being a Sicilian American myself, from you know, with my family, I'm not from New York, but my family's from New York. Um, some of the stereotypes are true, um, and there's a lot more to it than uh, than you know what. Was yeah, in there that, are reasons what was in that, that stereotypes and behaviors exist, other than that they exist because they are Sicilian, etc. It's the context that's lost, isn't it, rather than the action? Yeah. Well, I mean, La, La Cosa Nostra started as a resistance movement from, you know, from Sicilians who were tired of getting beat up by the French. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you, you don't get that in The Godfather. <laughs> but these, as you said, these are all constraints of the time and materials that are available. These are not intentional mistakes. And these are things that have been right. ratified and changed over multiple editions to get what is, I think, that the 20th edition lines are the best editions that have been published. Thank I think you. Vampire 20 is fabulous. I think Mage 20 is incredible. Um, I've not 
I, I've played some Werewolf 20, which is actually my first uh, interaction with Werewolf. Um, I've got a friend who is very excitedly waiting for Wraith 20 to be published um, because of the sheer... Uh, yeah, that just came out. The, yeah, the PDF mm-hmm. was issued, wasn't it? For the... Uh, Mm-hmm. Uh, about two weeks ago, yeah. and he's he's super hyped about that because he I I introduced him to World of Darkness about a year ago, and he's he's been reading into a lot of different lines, and he really wants to play Wraith for the the mature, dark, and emotional content. But one of the players in our group has gone, you know what, Vampire is as dark as I think I can tolerate, so perhaps I would skip out on a Wraith game, and that's that's fine because there are different levels for everybody, and it's just knowing whether. Um, I I I love playing a World of Darkness game with moral discussion i in my mage game there was a four hour debate among player characters about the morality of killing drug dealers who were um ruining a neighborhood oh, and good. selling to drug kids uh which was eventually finished when the 14 year old virtual adept who was arguing that they shouldn't go and kill the drug dealers was asked so why do you own two mini guns <laughs> 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 at which point you yeah. go yeah yeah i guess they're, they're for security yeah and what are they going to do when they enact themselves to protect security yeah, yeah, I guess. Um, but, you know, I I love getting into those moral debates uh, in my vampire game. I I really played up in humanity for the group where one of the players has actually been targeted by this about who wants to reduce his humanity level um, simply to get back at his sire who wanted to raise a good child. Um, but similarly, that can also become emotionally exhausting. In my experience, World of Darkness games are some of the games where people get the most emotionally invested and the most involved in their character's thought processes. Um, because it encourages that kind of behavior, which is where it was. It's role play, not role play, comes from, doesn't it? Um, but sometimes it's also nice to turn all of that off and go kill some goblins and just, just play an adventure. And there is a realm for both of it. And you know what? Sometimes it's at the same table at different periods of time. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Very well said. Because like I said, World of Darkness can be emotionally exhausting. You, you can get back from a, a, a really intense World of Darkness session and just feel like you've had a huge argument or fight or stress and it's been an amazing experience but you can you can go to work the next day and think why am i so tired all i did was play a game <laughs> <laughs> so so about why i had turned my my back on white wolf for a while yeah that was as speaking as one of the people who was making those games it was emotionally exhausting to make them and uh the 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 the, the schedule we were making them on was unreal and by by the end of the 90s i was burnt out and in fact deliria fairy tales for new millennium which i came out with with my uh, uh my now former company laughing pan productions originated in a conversation where i was talking with mark jackson my longtime friend and collaborator who's also one of the primary mage artists uh mark and i were were talking this is about yeah, 1999 uh, maybe 2000 no, i guess it was 99 and he was saying, you know, what do you, well, you know, we've done vampires. What do you think the next big thing is going to be? And I said, I think the next big thing is going to be, and I was right too, damn it. <laughs> so the next <laughs> big thing is going to be fairies. I said, because fairy, fairies are about the, the mysterious, evoking the mysterious other and a sense and it's of old wonder. old fairies, old fairy lore, not, not modern day um, Tinkerbell. It's, the Seely, the Unseely, the Banshees, all, all the, the fae spirits of the world, the, the, the uncanny things. Yes, uncanny, exactly. Uh, but I, and I said that, I, I said, I, I said I'm, I'm tired of, of cynicism. I'm tired of black leather. I'm tired of, I'm, we were both wearing motorcycle you jackets. You were tired the of time, the 90s? Like, I was, <laughs> <laughs> by the end of the 90s, I was very tired of the 90s, but. But I said, you know, I'm tired of cynicism and apathy. I said, apathy isn't rebellion. It just looks like rebellion. It's it's but it, it's caving. I said, you know, that re- uh, hope is the bravest rebellion. And we both sort of looked at each other. And Mike said, man, that's really good. And I, yeah, Mike. I'm sorry, Mark. Mark said, man, that's really good. I'm like, okay, I'll take yeah, credit. Yeah, kind of. If, if, like if you want to say I was part of this discussion, I can say I can take credit for things that happened when I was about eight. <laughs> but uh, but it was. You know, I, I love, obviously, I love White Wolf because I'm still doing this crap. Um, but, uh, but, but by the end of the 90s, it, was, it had just gotten exhausting because that was all we lived, we ate, we slept, we played. We, everything we did was, 
world of darkness. I mean, that was the clubs we went to, the clothes we wore, the music we listened to. And I love it. It was, it, it was on a lot of levels, one of the greatest periods of my life. And it was also exhausting. Do you know how I try and describe the world of darkness to players who don't quite get it? Because it is very 90s. Even the new stuff, you know, Mage did a really good job of modernizing everything, I think, and bring it into the full color of the, of the world uh, that we live in today. But Vampire's still got that 90s edge to it because it's got that, that sort of grim, edgy gothicness to it in a way that Mage 20 stayed, sort of veered away from the goth side of it, I would say, or the punk side of it to an extent, and create something more modern. Um, I'd try to describe World of Darkness to people. Have you seen the film The Last Action Hero? Oh, yeah. So you know the scene when Charles Dance leaves the film and enters the quote-unquote real world and sees mm-hmm. all, all people getting mugged and, and no one's stopping them, and he goes and just, Kills someone and says, shoots his gun in the air and says, I just killed a man and nobody <laughs> is trying to stop me. And not waits me. for someone to come and just grins when nobody does. I say, that's World of Darkness. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's just our world, but worse, is the way to look at it. Which is making it kind of difficult to write this stuff these days. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've been, one of my, my constant complaints for the last year has been. How the hell do you write a how do you how the hell do you write a satirical game about a reality war when you're stuck in the middle how, of the How do we how do we write a better marauder than the Donald? <laughs> he's not even that enlightened. He's well, he's a pawn. I mean, no, but he is altering the world around him through his own own actions and beliefs in unfortunate ways with poor side effects. Gods, yes. Uh, that's and that's why true. I would call him a marauder. Because he he's altering he's altering the reality of your country in an unpleasant way. That's that's a, a political opinion from somebody who doesn't live there. Oh, I absolutely agree. I mean, uh, if I start on politics, no, nope, we, 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 we will we will we will move along. So we've we've had good DM, bad DM. Uh, now let's do DM versus storyteller. This is pretty brief. Is there a difference? Well, aside from the the, the trademark at the end, uh, when, when are, you, are you talking about a a are you talking about a DM as in the dungeon master versus the storyteller? with a capital S in White Wolf or Well you've got a DM, a GM, a storyteller, yeah. and you know, they're all the people okay. they're all the person running the game. Yeah. It's the simple way to define it. But uh, I have a friend called Oliver who who played White Wolf in the nineties at university and he says that White Wolf being explicit about it being a storyteller and not a games master really helped open them up to stories and to to that side of gaming. Good. Thank you. Yeah, I think that that's exactly what Mark had in mind. Uh and that's that's why we capitalized the, the why we capitalized the S is because it's a lot of the things that white wolf did that are that, that's that you know were most radical at the time um uh, are female mainstream pronouns. yep female pronouns uh gender neutral pronouns uh talking honestly about sex drugs um identity <clears throat> reality is at the start of the book telling you that you're not a member of the euthanasis yes <laughs> <laughs> and those those disclaimers, which if you want to see a disclaimer, the one for uh, the book of the fallen, which I'm writing now, is huge. But, I, I still uh, remember having a conversation with you and Travis about the book of Nod and somebody yeah. phoned. Yes, Travis yeah. Perfect details. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. When uh, try and people, track down people... the real book of Nod. Yeah, and 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 Travis is like, dude, it's a game. <laughs> no, no, it's not. It? No, no, it, this is fiction. If if you can't tell the difference between a fictional vampire Bible and the real thing, you need to stop playing. Again. And possibly see uh, will help. Yes. And I, I have, having been gaming for almost 40 years, I have run across a number of people, not nearly as many as, you know, Pat Poling would have said, but I've run into a number of people who just didn't know when to put the game down. And I wrote a series, to talk about my blog there, uh, I wrote a series of articles for New Witch Magazine back in 2005, I think they were, uh, about the deeper levels of gaming as well as game design and talking about how the power i feel of uh, of role playing games is that they give you a a forum and permission to assume elements of your personality that you might not recognize otherwise uh, i call it aspecting and i've got blog entries on that as well and, and young young came up with the concept originally the idea of 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 exploring the archetypal elements of your own personality and uh I think that the one of the, the great things about role playing is it gives you an opportunity to vicariously act out parts of yourself that are impossible, improbable, or illegal, or all three. Um, <laughs> and the downside of that is some people get so caught up in it, get so caught up in the, the vicarious element of what they can do that they one don't ask themselves whether they should, and two they they misplace their own lives along the way. 
me, and you don't just see that with role playing games. You can see that with any form of you know political affiliation, sports fandom, religion. God knows, <laughs> literally, uh, people can people who feel they have they, that who feel disempowered in their lives, who feel that you know that their lives are not worthwhile, can get sucked up into any kind of, of well social abuse. Um, and gaming is just one potential forum for that, but. There are people who who just feel that they don't have enough of a life that they have to compensate for it with with creating an imaginary one and, and lose track of where one and ends. And in that begins. regard, when I left university, I went through quite a period of bad depression. I had an awful job working for an unethical company. I had a lot of anger issues at the time, and I remember going to a, a vague meetup, and one person was sort of complaining that people were only talking about their RPG games and not about their real lives and, and etc. And they'll get quite annoyed and saying it's quite obnoxious that no one seems to be able to socialize in a context other than this. And I just thought, this is a group of role players. It is literally a role playing group. Like, I know you want to get to know people beyond the game, but for someone like me at that time who literally felt like they had nothing else interesting going on in their life and their weekly game was the highlight, was the only positive point of that week, telling them they shouldn't be talking about it because it, you know, it is boring and that they should be talking about their real life when their real life is, is in a poor state is quite hurtful. For people, it's, it's really an outlet. You know, I, I, I would I would go and do really cool stuff courtesy of my GM every week, Liam, who I will, you know, before we wrap up good GMs and bad GMs and, and what makes it, he gave me one of the best pieces of advice on GMing I've ever heard, you know, and I, I, I was excited every week. And that is also one of the areas where I go through that period of depression. I have maybe had my poorest behavior in a game when something happened to my character and I was very upset and I, I threw a bit of a tantrum and I learned from that experience, but it all combined to make my behavior not great in that session. But it was that was the highlight of my week. That was the time where something interesting was happening, and it didn't matter that it wasn't quote unquote real because my real life was really not in a good place. You've just touched on something that is an unbelievably contentious subject at the moment uh, in this hobby, but but really you know is, is <laughs> well it, it is kind of a central uh, a central argument at the moment. The idea that the people there there are people who are trying to gatekeep what their impression of the hobby is. And feel very possessive about it, and are being abusive and awful to people who disagree with their playstyle. And find a group that find a group that enjoys your playstyle. With the internet now, with Discord, the, the forum, the format we're using to record this conversation, I, I play one game every week where um, we're face to face around a table, and I play I GM one game online every week with people that I met in London when I worked there for a year, including Tom. Mm-hmm. If you don't have a cool. group who likes your style, there, there is plenty of them online. I think there are some more issues with playing it online, but it's, 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 <laughs> yes. it, 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 it makes it possible in a way that it wasn't before. I mean, otherwise it couldn't be in Mike's game. So whatever the limitations of playing online are, the fact that I can play the game when I couldn't before is the key thing. Exactly. My, my introduction to, to online gaming other than um, the, the mushes and so forth was a, a friend of mine who is a surgeon, and uh, she was saying she got into... Um, pretty sure it was uh, everquest at the time uh she was telling me about how you know she she'll get home she'll have like a you know a 16 hour day or something absurd like that she'll get home at three or four o'clock in the morning can't, can't sleep because she's you know been saving people and stuff all day but she wants to game and she could log on she says i could go i could log on to everquest at four o'clock in the morning find a group and find a group of people to game with and uh, that that was that was a pretty much a revelation for me. I, I'm I'm not a big fan of online gaming because of a lot of people I've encountered on it. Um, but uh, but that's a, yeah. That's a really it's good. Easiest reason. to be toxic when there's distance and anonymity. Yeah, that's a, that's, <laughs> that's the negative side effect of the internet. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Hello, everyone. It's Tom here. You may have noticed that we're really enjoying our discussion with Sata, and also that we're discussing a lot of interesting topics. We ended up recording for over three hours, and so we made the decision to split this into two podcast episodes, about an hour and a half each. We didn't really want to lose anything. It was just too good a conversation to miss. So we're ending the episode here, and next time we'll pick up where we just got to, which was a discussion of communities within gaming. If you've been enjoying this podcast, make sure to come along and comment on Reddit on the uh, website, and also you can find us on patreon.com forward slash TTSS, where you can support any of the podcasts produced by myself, which is Tinker Taylor Sort of Sponge Productions. And we'll see you very soon. Goodbye.